Okay, so well, we are still talking about the chapter, the reservoir characteristic. Uh, today we'll talk about the effect of diagenesis on the porosity of the rock, and we'll see how it, uh, people estimate the reserve, hydrocarbon reserve, the reserve calculation, and how people uh, produce the hydrocarbon. So there are several methods to produce the hydrocarbon, so we're going to uh, briefly review the, each method today. So we have pretty thick handout today, right? So I hope we can cover it all in one class. Um, so first, uh, the topic is the effect of biogenesis on the reservoir quality. So it's about, so I think we've seen that the initial porosity, when the sediment is settled and the, it's uh, deposed, then initial porosity was affected by, affected by the well, particle size and the grain size distribution, right? And what else? Was there more? Mm. And then after the initial burial, the initial porosity will keep decreasing with time, right? As it gets uh, deeper, you have a compaction, and also the overburden stress will increase. So, and including all this kind of, all this uh, secondary effect, we call it uh, diagenesis. So there could be some compaction effect when there's a porosity reduction. Right? So once the burial begins, many changes take place, and porosity is diminished, diminished and permeability is also diminished. And any changes with time is referred to as the diagenesis. So it's, it involves the times. And effect of diagenesis in sandstone reservoir is generally the uh, primary compaction, or primary changes. So the porosity reduction is normally caused by the compaction. And secondarily, it can be reduced by cementation or increased by the uh, solution, dissolution. And in the carbonate, as we know, the compaction is not the primary thing. So secondary effect is more dominant. So you have cementation and the uh, dissolution. Uh, so we're going to see uh, what kind of diagenetic process affects the porosity and the reservoir quality. Um, generally, we, the sandstone reservoir have porosity of 20% or 10 to 20%. Right? And the permeability is about millidarsis. Huh? So when the reservoir has the permeability larger than 100 millidarsis, we call it very good reservoir, good quality. And less than 10 millidarsis is a very poor and tight reservoir, right? Uh, so in, uh, in average, it's about tens of millidarsis. And porosity at a given depth can be determined from the porosity gradient and the primary porosity. So this assumes that the porosity decreases with depth. So if this is sorry, Z increasing, this is the porosity, then this will be the gradient, right? The G or so here, the porosity D is the porosity at a given depth of interest, and the porosity P is the primary porosity at the surface. That's the when initial porosity that we talk. And G is the porosity gradient. So here, gradient is given as percent porosity per kilometer. So you will see one kilometer per kilometer, how much porosity is being reduced. So the next, this graph shows the, uh, the porosity reduction with depth. And depending on the region and the geological condition, you have a different uh, gradient. Right? So some area you have very high gradient. So G is high. And here you have a very low gradient. Right? Here it's more stable, we call it in terms of the porosity reduction. And here is less stable. 
the stable means that the porosity is being uh, more like consistent with that. But less stable means the porosity is being reduced rapidly. And main variables that affect the porosity gradient are the mineralogy and texture, and geothermal gradient and the pressure. So uh, if you have a quartz, then because the quartz is very stable, so that it will be chemically very stable. Right? And if you have a carbonate, then that's very uh, friable and very chemically unstable, so it may be uh, more subjected to the secondary diagenetic process, uh, porosity change. So volcanic, for example, volcanistic sand, it's chemically unstable, so you have a higher, high gradient. And pure quartz sand is stable, stable so it's the lowest gradient. And so it's about the mineralogy. And then also texture affects the gradient. So if you have a poorly salted sand, which means that it's a well-graded sand, right? So you have a small particle and a large particle together. It, it, that means the poorly salted. Then it can compact more and lose the porosity faster than the clean and well salted sand. So it's pretty obvious, right? And Thermal gradient also affects the porosity gradient and the rate of a chemical reaction increases with time. So higher temperature means that you have a possibility to lose the porosity faster. Okay. And so higher <coughs> here you have a graph of porosity gradient versus temperature. And as the temperature increases, you have a higher right, porosity gradient. Right? A geothermal gradient. Okay. So the faster the rate of the porosity flows because of the faster chemical reaction. Now what happens if you have an overpressure? So if you have an abnormal pressure which is blocked by some barrier, right? So we can, there could be some overpressure, right? So there was some condition to have the overpressure. And when there's an overpressure, it means that the, the water inside is blocked. It's isolated. So then there will be no circulation. Right? And circulation is very important in terms of the diagenesis. Right? When you have a fresh water or the, some other uh, cone water coming to this region, then you have a mineral coming in, or it could be acidic water or the basic water. Right? But if the water is sta uh, stagnant and it is uh, stationary, then there is no chemical reaction very active. Right? So abnormal pressure preserves the porosity reduction by decreasing the effect of the compaction. Um, and you know, once, you, once you have the petroleum that's trapped, then the circulation of the corneal water is diminished and further cementation is inhibited. So it's the same concept. So when you have a sedimentary formation which is in the trap, that means that the hydrocarbon gets accumulated and the water doesn't move so that you don't have any chemical reaction. So they will be very small and uh, minimal chemical reaction. So presence of oil and gas helps the preservation of porosity in sand. So generally, if you have a cap rock and there is an oil reservoir and there is a, another formation, just the water bearing formation, then here the porosity Reservoir is much higher than the underlying formation because of the presence of the oil and gas. Mm -hmm. So you can see it from here. The so water saturated sand it decreases like this, and the oil saturated sand it's higher than the water saturated sand and the gas saturated sand. In terms of porosity. Hmm. And then there was the porosity gradient, right? And porosity can be lost by cementation 
and the compassion. Right? Compassion is the primary is cause, and the secondary cause is the cementation. And small amount of cementation is actually beneficial to uh, maintain the structure of the sandstone. Right? It will increase the strength of the sandstone, but extensive cementation is bad because it will diminish the porosity and permeability. And main mineral may grow in the pores uh, is the quartz and the calcite and the clay. So cementation, when we talk about the cementation in the uh, petroleum geology, uh, you have an initial compaction and in because of the, the water, the saturated with some mineral or the acidic water coming in or beige water coming in, it can uh, trigger the chemical reaction that precipitate the mineral, right? And these three are the main components that the petroleum geologists are concerned about. So the quartz and the calcite and the clay. Uh, we'll see each one. And quartz is a common cement. It generally grows as an optical continuous overgrowth on the uh, detrital quartz grain. And silica solubility increases with pH. So you have a like, basic water somewhere and that's been dissolving the silica and when this water comes into the reservoir and when the pH is right, then they will precipitate out right? the silica so that the quartz can grow. So the quartz cement is, is growing and filling the gap here. Right? And calcium carbonate also can grow well. Right? Have you, uh, mm, like when you go beach and leaf, these kind of carbonates are all grown by the cementation and the crystal growth, right? So, Sano Kyo, what's Sano? Sano, what's that? The leaf? Yeah. So, like in a Sano Kyo, it's like a calcium carbonate. It's like a uh, shell growing up, right? Um, so, the calcium carbonate solubility increases with decreasing pH. So, it's acidic water, it dissolves the calcium carbonate more. And calcite cementation is result of the alkaline fluid moving through the pores. Uh, quartz and carbonate cements are both found at shallow depths, and they are uh, commonly found at the top and bottom of the reservoir. So when there is a shale, so this is the shale, and this is carbonate, maybe limestone. Or maybe it could be the sandstone. So, because of the uh, compaction with time, the water will be squeezed out to the uh, lower permeability, uh, the higher permeability bed, right? So, the water comes in and they precipitate out. So, the mineral comes out. So, that when you look at the sonic log, this is the higher velocity. BP. You can see that this is the shale and shale, and in the cars, in the uh, sand formation, you have an increase at the top and bottom. Okay. So calcite cementation is enveloping the sand body in this case. Huh? So this is uh, it's commonly occurred in the uh, sandstone formation. And the last mineral that decrease the porosity is the clay. And clay is, um, we're gonna talk about it uh, soon, but the, the, the parent material is the rock, right? The clay is generated from the rock. And clay may be present in the sandstone either as a detrital matrix or as a oxygenic cement. And here the uh, detritus is the, just, uh, chip, rock chip, it's broken, and fragment, and the oxygen mineral means that it's formed by precipitation instead of being transported from the somewhere. Right? So oxygen mineral is formed in situ at that place from the solution. Right? Uh, just, that's the uh, definition of the terminology. And the clay generation or creation is 
majorly there are three groups of clay, the kaolinite and elite and the momolonite. Because we, all, we are very familiar with these three clays. And first, let's look at the kaolinite. Uh, you can see it's a well-formed and blocky crystal with pores, and crystal may have only a minor effect on the permeability because the uh, plasticity is the smallest, it's uh, the least plastic clay. And kaolinite forms and stable in acidic solution. Actually, the kaolinite is commonly from the feldspar, the transform from the feldspar. And it occurs in continental deposits, so in the, uh, old, the old land, okay? yeah. onshore, sorry. So oxygen cement in sand has, that has been flushed by acidic water, so it, it prefers the acidic condition. And the in, but uh, on the contrary, the a light, it grows as a fibrous crystal. You can see it's uh, like a fiber. And, uh, it's more like a fiber structure. And crystal often bridge over the pore throat in a tangled mass. So it, when you have a sand grain and the clays are reaching these sand grains and blocking the pore, so this reduces the permeability significantly. So if you have a elite cement in the sandstone, then you have, it's, it's likely to have very low permeability. And it forms in the alkaline environments, which are different from kaolinite. Kaolinite prefers to have, to be formed in acidic condition. And elite is likely to be formed in the alkaline condition. And the marine sediments you found, you find, and this kind of elite lithic clays a lot. Actually, in Ulun Basin, if you analyze the clay mineralogy, then the elite is the dominant clay in the sediments, so in the East Sea. And momolonite, also the smectite type of the mineral, it's formed from the alteration of the volcanic glass. Volcanic ash, and they are found in both continental and deep marine deposits. And momolonite is very famous for absorbing water and swelling, right? Like bentonite. So it has the ability to swell. And reservoirs with momolonite are very susceptible to formation damage if drilled with the conventional water based mud. Because when you drill with water, it absorbs the water and it can swell. And Therefore, it must be drilled with an oil-based mud. And this is also uh, true for the shale drilling. And during oil production, water displaces oil and causing the ammonite to expand and reduce the permeability. So when you look at the permeability of the sandstone with the clay cement, kaolinite for the same porosity has a higher permeability. Elite is uh, being placed beneath the kaolinite. So it's with the same porosity, about 15%, elite is about 1 mg Darcy, and kaolinite is about 10 mg Darcy. Um, this slide is to just uh, refresh your memory. Uh, I've been using this size for soil mechanics one. And original clay mineral. So when there's a rock parent material, and if there's a water circulation, then it will dissolve the rock mineral and then it will precipitate out when the condition is uh, proper. So for example, when CO2 gas dissolves in water, it becomes a carbonic acid. So the water will become acidic water. And then when this was HD water meets the feldspar, then it tends to dissolve the uh, potassium ion and silica from the feldspar, and feldspar transform into kaolinite. And uh, this reaction is very famous 
for this Carolina formation, Carolinization, if we call it. And alteration of feldspar into kaolinite is very common in decomposed granite. And clay are common in the filling material of the joints and bolts in the roughness and parent material and weathering. So when, formation, uh, when we look at the formation of the clay mineral, parent material and the weathering process is very important. These are the two two governing factors in the clay formation. And typically, so the, also it's depending on the drain condition. So when you have a poorly drain condition and well drain condition, you have a different clay formation, even though the, you have same parent material. So uh, geochemistry, the people who uh, research geochemistry are very interested in this kind of a clay mineralogy and uh, how these clay are formed uh, depending on the stage in terms of the time, right? temporal, temporal scale, and uh, geological condition determines the, uh, what kind of a clay mineral is formed. Mm. So just to give you an idea, feldspar, as we just talked, can be end up being the kaolinite and halloid site. And Moscovite becomes the smectite, so it becomes the momolonite. And there's elite. Elite is here, right? and chlorite is here. So there are very complex relations between these uh, clay mineralogy. Okay. So, Porosity can be lost by compaction and secondarily by the cementation, right? So in summary, the cementation and cementing agents was the quartz and carbonate, right? calcium carbonate, and the clay mineral. So th that was the, uh, that we've been talking. And also the diagenesis and temporal process can increase the uh, porosity right? by the dissolution. So generally, leaching the uh, carbonate cement and grain with the acidic water, it will increase the porosity. So with the acidic solution, and metallic water can be rich in carbonic acid and the humic acid, so it can be acidic. And carbonic uh, kaolinization and leaching generate the solution porosity that is enhanced by fracture and also the carbonic acid solution are expelled from the mature source rock ahead of the petrol migration, and these acid fluid generate secondary porosity in the reservoir bed. Uh, so then porosity and permeability are often higher in hydrocarbon reservoir than in the underlying water zone. That's the presence of the hydrocarbon inhibits the cementation by preventing the corner water from circulating moves through a trap. That's, I think we've talked about this one. Mm. Okay, so in summary, the simple flow chart, you have a initial deposition of the, the grain, right? so initial porosity about 40%, 50%, and shallow burial, the compaction and minor cementation, 20%, 30%, so now porosity has been decreased. And if there's an oil trap, hydrocarbon invasion, the cementation stops, right? And if not, it's going to uh, go deeper and deeper, right? So the, you have a more cementation and compaction, so the porosity will decrease to 10%. And if there's an unstable grain, which is vulnerable to dissolution, then because of the water circulation, this mineral can dissolve so that the, you have Porosity increase. So then this is what leaching. And if not, so 
the this sediment will go deeper and deeper so that the pressure will increase more and the temperature will increase more so that at some point it will transform to the metamorphic rock. Right? So it's metamorphism. Okay. Uh, the effect of diagenesis on carbonate reservoir, it's, I think uh, we already know most of it. And carbonate rock includes the uh, limestone Composedly, composed largely of calcite and the dolomite. So dolomite is also the uh, name of the mineral, and calcite is the, these two are the major components consisting of this limestone. And silica is chemically more stable than calcite. So the effects of diagenesis are more uh, marked. It's more significant in limestone than in sandstone. And sandstone primary origin, so first reduction is uh, sedimentation and the primary origin, the compaction. And carbonate rock is made by dissolution and re-precipitation of the mineral. Secondary origin is more strong. Uh, I'm gonna just briefly go over the uh, uh, major types of the carbonate reservoir, the reefs. It forms at uh, reefs. You've seen this kind of pictures before, right? The overall in the uh, oceanic reef and oceanic condition, you have a, you've seen this kind of leaf. And initially the porosity is about 60 to 80%. Because the leaves are already uh, liquefied, they do not undergo compaction. And when steady the flow of the alkaline cone water passes through the leaf, first it may gradually be lost by the formation of a mosaic sparite cement. And when acidic material flows through the leaf, the leaf may be reached and the porosity will be enhanced. So when this alkaline water comes in, then you have cementation. And if there's an acidic water comes in, then you have dissolution. And the second is the lime sand. Lime sand may have high primary porosity because they are unconsolidated. However, they begin to lose porosity quickly on burial. Alkaline fluid is the same. Uh, later diagenesis, the acidic water and the alkaline water, so it's in the, it can enhance the porosity and they cause the cementation. Each and each. Um, so, when there is a carbonate, calcium carbonate sand deposition, uh, without the cementation, you have a rapid porosity loss by compaction. And early cementation it will prevent the compaction, and all invasion also prevents the compaction. And uh, development of the solution porosity or in base solution pores inhibit the late cementation so that there are several possibilities that you have a, a significant porosity in the uh, carbonate rock. Mm. And lime mud, so we'll just skip this part. Just so. This is just for your reference. And uh, when you look at the oceanic sediment with SEM, and when you look at the particle shape, there are so many fragments which looks like shell. And these kind of minerals are precipitated from the plankton, so it's a dead body of the plankton. Okay? So it's a microbially produced. And, uh, uh, plankton in debris organism is commonly found, and it could be calcareous, so it, it could be uh, made of carbonate, and it could be silicious, eh? so it's made of silica, SiO2. Mm -hmm. And this, the presence of this kind of uh, ooze or the diamond, uh, diato, diatom, diatomaceous earth, uh, affects the mechanical and the hydrological behavior because it has a lot of pores. Eh? and with the uh, very uh, strange shapes. So, see uh, different pictures. 
it, ha it has very internal, uh, large internal pores. Huh? And so then effect of the diagenesis can affect the reservoir quality, especially the dolomite reservoir. Um, dolomite can form from the calcite, and also calcite can form from the dolomite. And primary dolomite, here the secondary dolomite is, is more important, and the secondary dolomite, needs, it forms generally under the unconformity and around the fractures. And around the fracture, because you have a, a higher permeability, so that the water comes in and out more, so that you have a more active chemical reaction, so that the limestone can turn into dolomite and turn uh, also vice versa. Mm -hmm. uh, secondary dolomites are more permeable than the primary dolomite. And when the calcite is replaced by dolomite, bulk volume is reduced by 13%, so that it enhances the porosity. So, you can see that there are many boggy type of porosity, right? That's by um, dissolution and uh, volume change. And uh, besides the cementation and besides the dissolution, also fracture and weathering can affect the reservoir quality. So atypical and fracture reservoir. And typical reservoir is what? Typical reservoir is the sandstone and carbonate, right? And atypical reservoir means that you often sometimes find the reservoir, commercial reservoir in the shale or basement rock. Right? That's called the atypical reservoir. Um, so atypical reservoir is about 10%, but uh, I think this number is increasing. And Atypical reservoir ranges from various types of basement to the fracture shale. Any rock can be a petroleum reservoir if it both porous and permeable. Uh, so atypical reservoir may form by two processes, weathering and the fracturing. So weathering is generally the chemical weathering, not physical weathering, because it's very deep. And solution porosity, so this kind of a dissolution can increase the permeability. So they can be uh, play. You can play as a role as a the reservoir, and fracture also can turn any brittle rock into reservoir. Um, so we've known this one, and important part: fracture is very. Uh, these days, it's very important to quantify. So there are parameters to quantify the fracture intensity. And fracture intensity index is defined as this equation. So if you look at the, uh, this equation in detail, you have a total porosity, phi t, and minus phi matrix. So m is the porosity without the Fracture. So if there's a fracture of rock and you take the sample here and you take the same uh, porosity of a matrix is here and the total porosity is from all bulk volume, right? So if this total porosity increases, then what happens? The FII will increase, right? So higher value of FII means that you have a more fracture and the reservoir quality is better. Mm. The shale production, so shale, shale gas and the shale oil production is being, because it's, uh, now it's possible because of the fracturing uh, technology. And so we use the hydraulic fracture to produce more oil and gas from the shale. Okay. And about the fracture, we're going to uh, have more presentation from Christine, right? And, okay, so that was the reservoir, the effect of dynogenesis on the reservoir quality.
So actually, it's in light of the uh, porosity, the vegetable porosity. Um, so if you remember the, the, I think the first class in the chapter 6, we talked about the, the, how the porosity is being generated in the vegetable rock. Right? That, that was affected by the uh, sedimentation and the particle size and the particle shape. And then we talked about multi-phase, like contact angle interface attention and the relative permeability. And now we are coming back to uh, the porosity in the last section. And we're going to talk about the hydrocarbon reserve and the production of the hydrocarbon. Okay. Uh, so reserve calculation, uh, we should define two, param two uh, terminology here. Uh, reservoir is a subsurface rock formation containing one or more individual separate natural accumulation of movable petroleum that is confined by impermeable rock and characterized by a single pressure system. So reservoir is, if you have a reservoir here, and if you have a reservoir here, and then you have a two reservoir, right? Because this pressure and this pressure will be set different. But if you have a reservoir that's this, and the inside you have a shell like this, but if this is one, characterized by one pressure system, then it's just one reservoir. Okay. So that's the uh, definition. And reserve is hydrocarbon quantity which is anticipated to be commercially recovered from known accumulation from a given day forward. Okay. So reserve means the quantity of the hydrocarbon. Okay. Or reserve estimation or reserve calculation means that how much hydrocarbon will be there and how much we can produce. Okay. So rough estimate of the reserve prior to drilling a trap can be calculated as uh, using this equation. Recoverable oil reserve is bulk volume times the F, huh? recoverable oil. And here the F is defined as the uh, Uniform the hydrocarbon volume per unit volume of formation. Right? So acre is the area, and feet is the thickness of the formation. Right? So acre is is about four kilometer, four thousand square meter, and one feet is about thirty centimeter. So acre feet means that one, two, three, four cubic meter of the rock formation. So recoverable oil reserve gives you an idea that how much oil is there and uh, how much we can produce from the, the, the unit volume of the rock. And the volume is calculated as, part, so when here the V, when we calculate the V, the volume of the, the reserve, we, we have a contour isometric sketch from the ice, and we can calculate the volume using this equation. So area at the bottom, area here, here, and so you make a slice, and then sum up the, or each volume of the slices. And when you calculate the F, recoverable oil per eight acre foot. This is, this is the tricky part. It's the most difficult figure to assess unless the local information is available from adjacent field. So the easiest way to calculate this reserve is that you look at the information from the surrounding field. So maybe like you have a Canada and then you have a certain area and you if there's a information available, then you can use it to back calculate the F. And, but if not, then you have to start from the geologic information. So you have average porosity and the recovery factor F. And the recovery factor F is here, 30% for sand, and uh, 20, 1 to 20% for the carbonate reservoir. Actually, this R is affected by several factors, where spacing, 
and reservoir permeability for the viscosity and the effectiveness of the drive mechanism. Okay, uh, post discovery uh, reserve calculation. Once a field has been discovered, accurate data become available, and a more sophisticated formula may be applied to calculate the recoverable oil. And here you can use this equation. What is this? Yeah. That's it. Um, I misplaced the box here. Um, volume is. Again, it's the rock formation volume, reservoir volume, and P is the porosity. So the uh, reservoir volume or the reserve volume can be estimated from the seismic interpretation. So if you have a seismic data, then from that, you can calculate the V. And the porosity, you estimate from the logging data or the core data. And water saturation, also you estimate from resistivity low or the core data. And the record factor, you can estimate it, uh, or you can get the information from our system field. And then F, VF, with the formation volume factor, you divide it with the formation volume factor, because, um, hmm. if this is the oil, and if you take the oil out in the atmospheric Pressure and temperature condition, you have gas coming out of the liquid. So, and you only calculate the volume and reserve this crude oil liquid. Right? So, the volume will decrease yeah, by a lot. So, that this formation, for example, uh, one cubic meter oil at the reservoir con condition will contract to 0.5 cubic meter at the surface. Because the, uh, the gas, solution gas will come out and they will just evaporate. Eh? So then formation factor will be the two. Formation volume factor will be two. So generally, you don't uh, collect this gas. You only sell this liquid part. So because uh, it it costs more money to collect the gas. And the FBF depends on oil composition. So if you have a more gas dissolved in the uh, crude oil, liquid oil, then the FBV, FBF will increase. So this FBF can be estimated by calculating the solution gas oil ratio, GOR, and the oil density. And low GOR and the heavy crude FVAF is close to one. And the high GOR and the volatile oil will have the factor more than two. So we expand. So you contract by a factor of two. So you can see that the, as gas ratio increases, you have a formation volume factor increases. Okay. And here the GOR is defined as the volume ratio of the gas and liquid phase obtained by taking the petroleum from the reservoir temperature, uh, pressure temperature condition to the surface pressure temperature condition. Move on. Um, but actually, uh, as the field is produced, the pressure drops and flow rate diminishes, and the gas and oil ratio also vary depending on the type of driving mechanism. So we're going to see how the GOR uh, vary with time. And initially, let's say that you have a reservoir, it's not being produced, then fluid pressure is higher than the other surrounding area because it's trapped. So then 
when you place the well and the oil will come out, right? So that the reservoir pressure will decrease with time. And as the pressure drops, solubility also decreases so that you have a gas cap created at the top of the reservoir. And it's called the uh, solution, dry, uh, solution gas dry. So then this gas pressure will push, up, push the oil down when you have a well, right? So that the oil comes out. So, as time goes by, the pressure will decrease, and at a certain point, you have only the gas coming out, right? And the oil, the, the ratio between the gas and oil will increase very high, so that the, uh, the oil production will be low, right? So then it becomes a more uh, uneconomical. Okay. So then, uh, homework is to uh, how people estimate the uh, reserve, and the, what's the definition of the OIP and the OGIP, and how you can estimate that. So it's going to be given to you. Hmm. Any, uh, because you have a question. Too fast. 질문, 혹시 질문이니? So then uh, we're going to talk about the production method. This is a more fun. Uh, recovery of the hydrocarbon from reservoir is commonly uh, recognized in several stages. And you have a primary recovery stage and secondary recovery stage and tertiary recovery stage. And primary recovery stage, you use the natural pressure of the reservoir, natural energy of the reservoir. So you just drill a pipe, drill a hole, and then place a pipe, and the oil and gas will come out. That's primary recovery. Right? And uh, after the primary recovery, the reservoir pressure will drop down so that the oil and gas doesn't come out anymore, then you have to push it out, right? So in that case, you may inject the water and gas to compensate or to increase the, uh, refill the pressure and displace the oil and gas. It's called a secondary recovery. So it can be water flooding or the gas flooding. And tertiary recovery is after water flooding or the gas flooding, uh, you can maybe do some thermal injection, heat injection, or chemical injection, or the gas injection to increase and to extract the hydrocarbon remaining uh, in the reservoir. And the last one is the impure recovery. It's carried out when the recovery from the previous three phase has been completed. It involves drilling the chip production hole between the existing bore to ensure that the whole reservoir has been fully depleted of uh, its oil. So infill recovery is that, let's say that you have uh, this kind of a trap and from the injection well and the production well, you um, produce, you've been producing this hydrocarbon and after these three phases, you maybe drill and one more hole or place the whole the production well in between and to ensure that all the hydrocarbon reservoir has been depleted to make sure that the reservoir is all empty. So uh, today let's look over the primary recovery drive mechanisms. There are five important driving mechanisms. Um, but so solution cap drive, gap drive, and gas cap drive, water drive, and these three are the uh, main mechanism. And gravity drainage is a uh, kind of a supplementary mechanism.
and combination or mixed driving mechanism. So uh, you may have gravity plus solution cap or the water plus gas cap. Right? So let's look at the solution gas drive first. Huh? This drive mechanism requires the reservoir route to be completely surrounded by impermeable barrier. And in, in the beginning, you have only the oil in the reservoir. And when the, as the production occurs, the reservoir pressure drops. And exolution and expansion of the dissolved gas happens. Right? So as the pressure, pressure decreases, solubility, gas solubility, decreases, right? So that the, you have gas coming out, and this refill the pressure. So, and this energy pushes out the, uh, the oil, and it, you have the oil production. So, expand, uh, gas absorbing exor and <coughs> expanding from the water phase. It's exolution means that it's uh, uh, opposite of the dissolution. And solution gas drive reservoir is initially either considered to be undersaturated or saturated depending on its pressure. And when the, it's, it's called undersaturated when the reservoir pressure is larger than the bubble point of the oil. And as the pressure decreases, and when the reservoir pressure is less than or the same with the bubble point of the oil, then it's called a saturated reservoir. So that means that you have a gas, free gas phase. Yeah? Here, on the saturated case, we don't have the free gas phase. For an undersaturated reservoir, no free gas exists. So in this region, reservoir driving energy is provided only by the bulk expansion of the reservoir rock and liquid. For a saturated reservoir, oil production results in a drop in the reservoir pressure that causes the bubble, and gas comes out of the solution. The oil shrinks slightly. However, the volume of the exhaust gas subsequent expansion more than makes up for this. And gas expansion is the primary reservoir uh, drive for a uh, reservoir below the bubble point. So when you look at the um, pressure curve and the GOR trend, this is the gas and oil ratio. Uh, solution gas shows a particular characteristic pressure and GOR curve. And if reservoir is initially undersaturated, reservoir pressure can drop rapidly. So here, solution cap drive. And you have a rapid decrease in pressure with the oil production. Mm. Also interesting. And uh, on in this undersaturated phase, gas is only absorbed from the fluid in the well bore. So you have a, a low GOR right, in this phase. But when it reaches the bubble point, then pressure declines less quickly, and then GOR rapidly increases. So when we look at here, the pressure decreases, kind of a diminishes. The rate of the pressure reduction is diminished, and you have a rapid increase in GOR. So now, at this point, you have a gas cap or the free gas, free gas phase. It's called the saturated condition. Um, when the GO initially rises, the production, oil production falls, and artificial lift system are then instituted. <coughs> oil recovery from this type of reservoir is typically 20% to 30% of the OIP, with no oil in place, and only five, 0 to 5% of the oil is recovered above the bubble point. And this is the same. Uh, this graph shows the geological um, configuration. And before production, it's only the oil, right? And during the production or after production, 
and see that the gas cap is being created at the top of the reservoir. So in case of the solution gas drive, it's better to place the well at the bottom of the reservoir, right? Instead of the putting at the top. If you put it at the top, you have you will have only the gas coming out in the later stage. But if you put if you place the well at the, the bottom of the reservoir, then you have a longer hydrocarbon production and a more hydrocarbon production. Mm. Okay. Critical gas saturation point is when the uh, gas bubbles are separated and as time they come together and they form continuous free gas phase. Yeah. Okay. So critical gas saturation point defines the point that the gas phase becomes continuous and they accumulate as a gas cap in the crest of the reservoir. So here you have a gas cap. This is the gas cap. So they separate out from the, the liquid. So when you look at the, uh, the production curve, this is the GOR, right? So initially it's very low, but as the gas comes out, the GOR increases rapidly. And then when it becomes the uh, continuous phase and having a gas cap, then you have decrease in GOR and pressure decreases gradually and oil production also have a rapid drop and then it diminishes the time. Recovery factor in the range of 7 to 15 percent. And the second mechanism is the gas cap drive. So solution gas drive was the condition that there was no any free gas. But in this gas cap drive, you have a, a some extent of the, uh, it has the initially uh, the gas cap in the reservoir. So the main source of the reservoir energy is from the expansion of the gas cap already existing above the reservoir. And the presence of the expanding gas cap limits the pressure decrease experienced by the reservoir during production. The actual rate of the pressure decrease is related to the size of the gas cap. So if you have a, more, a larger gas cap, then it will maintain the pressure more right, because it acts like a cushion. So it will push out push down the oil so that you have a more hydrocarbon. So again, in the gas cap drive, it's better to place the uh, perforation and the, plate, the well at the bottom of the uh, reservoir rather than putting it at the, the crest. Right? Right? So this is the bad case, but it's better. And GOR rise only slowly in the early stage. Where is the GOR here? Gas cap drive. And production continues, gas cap expands, and oil and gas contact, gas and oil contact, GOC, down, move downwards. So that GOC reaches the production well, then GOR will increase rapidly. So this, when you look at the gas and oil ratio, it increases rapidly at this point, and this is the point that you have a gas cap touching the production well. So this is you all see, and so that it's, put, it's going down with time, so that at some point, you have only gas coming up, coming out from the well. Right? And pr pressure reduction is slower than the case of solution gas drive. Right? You see, it's here. But it's faster than the water drive. Um, recovery of the gas cap reservoir is better than the solution drive reservoir. It's about 20 to 40 percent. And this is, you can read it through. And thick oil column are better, best, and the population at the base is better. Huh?
and produced gas can be separated and immediately injected back into the gas cap to maintain the gas cap pressure. So this will help, help the oil production and the pressure support. Mm. It's the same. So it just show you the, uh, the picture of the hydrocarbon trap. So here you have a gas cap initially. And then you place the well. And then this oil and gas contact will go down. And when you see the uh, well bore around it, you will have an oil zone and a gas zone. And you have a coning like this. Huh? So drawdown zone may develop adjacent to a borehole in a manner analogs to but the reverse of the cooling at the oil and water content. Mm. We have a drill down. Where is it? Oh, oil and gas contact is being lowered. Yeah, that's very obvious. Mm. And Again, the recovery factor is about 20 to 50 percent. And I think uh, we talked about this one again. Yeah. So move on. And we'll move on to the uh, uh, next driving mechanism is the water drive. The water drive is that the reservoir is connected to an aquifer. So if you think about this, configuration, you have a gas, oil, and the water. And then if you open this valve, what happens? Because of the head difference, water will push it, the oil will come out, right? Because of the head difference. But then this can be found in the geology condition like this. You have an aquifer connected to the oil reservoir trap. So in this case, if you drill a hole and a place a well, then weight of this water will push up the oil to the production well, right? So this is called the water drive. So then what happens? As the wa uh, water pushing in, oil will come out, and the place being emptied by the oil production will be re recharged, hmm? refilled by the water. So there will be a water coming in so that the permeability of the reservoir and the water flow rate will be very important. So as the oil is being produced, water invades and lower the part of the trap. So here, initially the oil was here. And as the oil comes out, water is being invaded here, right? so that in this case, oil and water contact rises, huh? rises with time. Huh? Then you have a cooning around the, uh, the production well. So at some point in this water drive, oil, when you look at the oil and water ratio, initially the oil will be 100%, but as time goes by, the water comes in and at the well will be in contact with water, right? So that you have a water, high water production ratio. Uh, so this is the uh, graph showing that. Uh, in this water drive mechanism, uh, reservoir pressure drops in inverse proportion to the effectiveness of the recharge from the aquifer. So little change occurs in the gas and oil ratio. And while effective water drive, the flow rate remains constant during the life of the fluid, but the oil production declines inversely with the increase in water production. So here, the total fluid production is about the same, but as time goes by, you have a more water coming out. And uh, it's called a water cut is increasing, and the oil cut is decreasing. Right? And, but when you look at the GOR, the gas and oil ratio is pretty consistent. 
And water drive mechanism is generally the most effective with the recovery factor of the 60%. So among water and gas cap and solution drive, the water drive mechanism is the most effective. Um, yep, these are the uh, same concept. And you may have the bottom water drive configuration like this. Very small aquifer with a trap and symmetric. And here is a inclined and the edge water driving mechanism in this case. So production continues or extracted from the reservoir. And okay. So in this water drive, it's better to uh, place the production well at the crest of the reservoir right? rather than at the bottom. In the solution gas drive and the gas cap drive, it was better to place at the bottom, right? But here it's better to put it at the top. Right? Um, the same. So process history and the water-driven reservoir depends on critically upon size of the aquifer, permeability of the aquifer, and reservoir production weight. If the production rate is low, the size and permeability of the aquifer is high, and the reservoir pressure will remain high because all produced oil is replaced efficiently with water. Mm, water drive, I think uh, you can read this through, but GOR remains very constant. Right? Here, where's GOR? Here. GOR remains constant. Right? And the pressure also remains consistent. It doesn't decrease fast. Right? Okay, uh, that's the duplication. Um, sometimes if the, the ratio of the water to oil viscosity is large, and the production rate is high, and the fingering can occur which leaves the oil behind the reservoir. So if the production rate is high and the, the viscosity difference is high, then you may have this kind of a fingering water coming in, in finger, so that uh, you have some leftover oil in here. So high production rate, uh, rate is not always the, uh, the optimal condition. Um, gravity drainage is uh, when you have density difference between oil and gas and water result in, in their natural segregation. And then you have uh, oil coming out and gas is coming out, uh, going up. And best conditions for gravity drainage are thick oil zone and high vertical permeabilities. Actually, the, the gravity drainage is not uh, solely possible. So you always have this kind of a support as a supplementary driving mechanism with the other uh, main driving mechanism. So with this aid of gravity drainage, you have high recovery factor. To 50 to 70 percent, and sometimes you have mixed drive, so gas cap and the water driving together. Right? Mm. So then, uh, this is the summary chart: the recovery and the OIP. And when you compare these three, uh, here the water driving is the uh, the, the most efficient way.